Hi, welcome back to Eurejana 120. I am Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student at the University of Regina. And of course, the University of Regina being this place in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada, which, I mean, you, you should believe everything that I say because there's all these tens of thousands of people who have given money to this institution, and that this, this whole apparatus of professionals and uh, lectures and academics, uh, we, we couldn't possibly uh, be founded on incorrect premises, right? We, we couldn't possibly be uh, teaching falsehoods and uh, outright uh, being wrong in, in various respects. Well, of course not. Th this is true. Uh, the bandwagon fallacy, which is our topic of today, concerns these kinds of groups that have high status or groups that were popular or groups that have possibly up to thousands of people who uh, join into it thinking that because they're part of a large group that has kind of prestige or social status that that group is correct and that you should believe the, the words that come out of that group's mouth uh, regardless of how ridiculous they sound. This is the core of this fallacy, otherwise known as argumentum ad populum or kind of appeal to the, the popular popular or popular belief. Uh, appeal to, uh, or argument by consensus is another kind of variant of this, and we're going to get into it as we go here. So the, the idea of a bandwagon fallacy is another one of these newer fallacies. It's an informal fallacy, and it only dates to about the 1900 presidential campaign of uh, Brian, or, uh, Jennings Bryan in the States. So it's, it's not that old as far as these kind of basic facets of logic go. Um, and like the other fallacies we've covered, it's going to have a form. So it's going to start with I is popular, or some belief, or some, some group, or some something that you could believe in. Therefore, I is correct, and we would be correct in believing in that group or that, that idea or that argument. And of course, that isn't actually true. As, as you've seen, usually if you have an argument of this form, you're going to need uh, kind of a middle term here to, to be able to make this conclusion. Some some variants of this uh, on the web, if you go to Rational Wiki, they'll actually draw out the middle term, which is that popular things are usually correct, uh, which kind of further uh, gives you the impression of how ridiculous this is. Uh, but nevertheless, this is what it is and it's kind of root. So it's based on peer pressure, uh, and peer pressure is a very powerful thing. I'm, I'm assuming if, you see, if you're at the point where you're watching this video, you probably have an idea of what peer pressure is and how bad it is. But just kind of a, as a reiteration, this applies in arguments themselves. People will actually write, come right on and say it, you know, that you should believe this because it's popular. Um, and we'll get into some examples as we go. Uh, it's related to other fallacies uh, in the series so far, such as the uh, argument of prestige, uh, because it, this is going to, whatever it is that you're, you're trying to convince someone of, it's probably got some social status that you can refer to. So it's like, well, the, the popular people believe this, and the people who uh, per perhaps even are scientists believe this, so therefore you should believe it. Uh, again, that's not quite sufficient uh, of a reason. Uh, in the absence of absolutely everything else, if you absolutely did not have the internet uh, to assist you, if you didn't have any way of checking things out or verifying anything at all, maybe tentatively you could go with it and run with it, but it's worth any time you're given that as an excuse for something to go check it out yourself and see if that's actually the case. Another way, or another fallacy that this is related to is the argument uh, to authority, uh, which is again, uh, you're, you're, you're appealing to a, a group of people who have more power and therefore more authority on a particular topic, even if that group doesn't necessarily know what they're talking about. So this is a nasty uh, fallacy to get out of, uh, because well, first of all, humans clump. This is what one of the things we do. We, we organize ourselves into societies and teams and tribes and families and, and God knows what else, uh, over the silliest of things, all the way down from you know international geopolitics to you know w whether a straw uh, you know, a, a swirly straw is the best kind of straw, or you know, kind of a pointy straw, or what have you. And, and so there's always going to be these, these kind of uh, 
failure point where you can believe something because a group that you respect believes it without actually going through the effort and seeing it, that group is being reasonable. And it's hard to troubleshoot in another way in that it's often enough, uh, especially long-running groups and groups that have put a lot of effort into being correct, like the scientific apparatus of the world, uh, tend to be correct a lot. And so you can wind up with groups that have the right idea most of the time and then just utterly fail at something. But because they've built up a reputation and they've built up all of the, the kind of people around them who are used to getting the, the group getting things right, then you'll miss it when the group gets it wrong. And the participants of that particular bandwagon group will miss it when that group gets it wrong. And so it's, you know, being correct and being popular are not synonymous. But they do have enough in common that it's hard to tear them apart sometimes. But you'll see this happen, especially when groups learn something new. And so that there's a new way of doing things or a new way of looking at things. Or, or science discovers something and a new way uh, of doing things comes along and the group hasn't quite gotten to the point where enough of the group has been convinced of its validity that that part of the group has a consensus over the group. Thomas Kuhn talks about this sort of thing in his works. Uh, so it's, it's worth kind of looking how that process happens so that if it does start to happen, you don't immediately discount the minority groups who are trying to kind of make a change of things. Another thing worth pointing out is the ash conformity experiments. How these experiments work is there would be a, a, an experiment done where you know, someone like yourself would be invited to a boardroom with a bunch of other people and you'd be given a card. As you can see, these two lines are the same close enough. Okay. And so, there would be on one card a single line, and on another card there'd be three lines, which would be labeled A, B, and C, so that you could choose which of A, B, and C line on the second card corresponds to the exact same size as the first card, or the first line on the first card, so that you're basically saying, okay, this is how long this, this is. And how the experiment would work is there would be maybe 10 people in the room other than you, and you would be assuming that the other 10 people are just other experiment or victims, I guess. Uh, other people who are participating in the, the same experiment and who are not necessarily uh, part of the the, the control or part of the, uh, the, the, they're not on the scientists' team, when in fact that's exactly what they are, that they are just kind of props there uh, to convince you that what your line is, uh, is not actually what you think it is. And so when the first couple of questions will, will come out and everyone will agree on the answer because this is kind of getting you ready for the, the next step. So so. The, the first set of cards will get, okay, what, how big is this, and is it A, B, or C? And you'll say B, and everyone will agree that it's B. And then they'll do this again with a different set of two cards, and again with a different set of two cards. And on the 11th try, people who are the props in this experiment all agree with themselves on one of the incorrect answers. So they'll say it's C instead of B. And then the question is, if you are a free-thinking individual, do you say, oh, it's B, even though everyone else has said it's C? Or do you say, well, I guess it kind of looks like it could be C. Maybe I'm wrong. And then convince yourself by some kind of internal dialogue that even though you know, you're just looking at this thing and it's obviously B, that somehow you're, wrong, you're in the wrong and that you should believe the group. And out of this experiment, if and you can do this, they ended up doing about 12 trials, 11 or 12 trials. Uh, by the, the 11th or 12th trial, 75% of people agreed on one of the fake trials. So 75% of people agreed that something was not true was true purely because of peer pressure out of 12 trials. So, and you can imagine that the, the amount of people probably increased trial by trial where you get, kind of get that one small percent of, of a chance where you're fooling people. 
And then out of that, to be fair, they t took out uh, any result where people were actually legitimately confused of how big the, the line is, because there is a small percent, about 1% of that. But even so, that's still over 70% of people are will will agree to groupthink and will be subject to peer pressure on something as simple as a single line where it's obvious that they are correct and can be correct. On things that are not so obvious, the, the, you know, you're, ho you're hopeless, basically. You're, you, as an individual, will almost certainly, unless you're very indoctrinated against uh, groupthink, uh, will, will probably fall for it. And you'll probably be subject to peer pressure and almost certainly will put up with it. And so th this is just kind of a, a, a highlight of how possible it is for large groups of people to get into this situation. Now, when you add power into this mix, it even gets more de kind of depressing here. Uh, there's a, a quote from Upton Sinclair, who's a great author, by the way, uh, quote, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it, unquote. In other words, you can get to the point where even, you know, otherwise intelligent people just refuse to see something and refuse to call a group on its bullshit because they have a family and they have a house and they can't risk giving up the life that they have built over just being right in this one particular instance. Of course, sometimes that one particular instance can be really, really important and so it's worth considering that. And so, in general, if you have a, you know, the, the authority, the big guy with a big stick who will beat you until you believe something, chances are you're going to believe it. And if you're the 11th guy in a room of 10 people who have been beaten into submission, again, you'll probably fall for this trick, right? And so this is, again, a dangerous thing that we should be watching out for. Uh, going back to the package deal fallacy video, which again, go go watch some of the uh, previous videos if you haven't seen them in this series. Uh, we, we kind of talk about how advertisers approach groups and can influence group behavior. This is what they're going for. If they can get to the point where you're in a room of 12 people randomly chosen, which again, going back to the video from a couple videos ago about the, um, uh, the oh, I'm blanking on the, the fallacy, but basically the failure to, to appreciate random numbers. Um, well, that's going to bother me now. Okay, anyway, regardless. Uh, but basically, you, you get to the point where the advertisers have, have just by pure chance started to convince people based on this effect, based on you're just a random clump of 12 people, and now you're a random clump of 13 people because you've been able to leverage the you know, shared chance against your belief here. There's a third way that power can kind of amplify this, in that if the power controls the channel of communication that you're communicating through, so, for example, if there's a company that owns the television station you're kind of communicating or recording through, uh, then they can bias the final message so that it appears that everyone, or at least a majority, is involved with a particular campaign or a particular belief system or a particular idea. And they can not show the exceptions to this, and they can not show the, the people who are not involved. And sometimes it's an innocent mistake. It's just something that they don't think of. They don't have enough time to cover, but not always. Sometimes it's a, it is, in fact, intentional. You, you can get to the point where, for example, if, if you watch TV in Saskatchewan, you can often enough see a whole, you know, tens of thousands of people at Taylor Field Stadium having a good time watching the, their team, their bandwagon, do cool stuff. And especially when the, the team starts winning, people will start to flock towards it to, s to watch and, be, and participate in it. Uh, even at though, you know, a kilometer away, there's some poor guy working at Tim Hortons on the night shift who's being forced to wear this green jersey, even though he may not want to, and he doesn't even like football anyway. Uh, so there's this kind of bigger picture that sometimes you can miss if you just purely join the bad way. What are some symptoms of this? If, if you ever hear someone say, quote, nine out of 10 dentists or experts support this, unquote, uh, that, that's one of the biggest symptoms you can see of this sort of thing, where you're intentionally trying to make it seem as though there's a level of support uh, without actually going into the evidence of where this support comes from. Quote, everyone's doing it, unquote. Again, literally everyone, if literally everyone was doing this, 
then you wouldn't even have to make an argument like that. Because chances are, the person you're talking to would be one of the people who is doing that. And now, there may be some exceptions to that, but for the most part, when you hear that, there are no, no exceptions. Here's another one, quote. 20 million people are doing it, so it must be good, unquote. Well, uh, it could be the other way around, too, right? 20 million people might just be making a mistake. There's a 7 billion people in the world. By chance, there's going to be 20 million making almost every mistake that you can make. That, that's, you know, you go, go do the math, go, go see if you have a 1 in 1,000 chance, what's the chance of the 20 million people doing this? Again, it's, it's, it's going to be plausible at the very least. Uh, so, and an, the best example of this is probably religion, because let's take a look, you know, 1.5 billion Muslims can't be wrong. Well, actually, they probably can. Again, based purely on these two effect, effects alone, they can absolutely be wrong. And then there's, of course, the problem that leaving Islam is a little hard because being an apostate is sometimes a death sentence. So that's kind of a complicated issue. But even ignoring that, you know, the six billion theists can't be wrong. Well, yeah, they can because we, we learn from these experiences that we have and we don't necessarily have to just believe something because everyone else believes it. Uh, and so in this case, uh, absolutely, theists can be wrong. I would argue that they are uh, another thing worth noting is that uh, people can switch their loyalties very quickly, especially when there's violence involved. Uh, and so uh, you, you can get into these situations where uh, large groups have really big disagreements, and the easiest way to resolve the disagreement is just for one side to just capitulate and say, well, I was always a, a supporter of the Green Team. Hey, go Green, right? Uh, and, and this happens. The, the, uh, Ted Roll uh, talked about this in his uh, To Afghanistan and Back uh, book. And there's a, it, it, in some places more than others, because some places are more stable than others, uh, you'll, you'll see this. In kind of a local political example, uh, the Liberals uh, in, used to be the, the natural governing party of Canada. For generations, they were either the party who governed the country or had enough seats in Parliament to be the official opposition and was realistically still in power. Uh, for, for so many years it was like that, until this past uh, election, when they were taken down to 34 seats uh, by an ascendant New Democrat Party in Canada, down from well over 150. This, this can happen, and this can happen almost overnight, when, especially as large, uh, complex communication systems allow for really quick turnabout action, you can get to the point where, for example, the, you know, prevailing party that has captured the mind share of an entire country is suddenly not popular anymore and suddenly not in power. This happens and let's hope that it happens again this election. Also worth pointing out is bandwagons have momentum. Uh, so there's an analogy kind of being made here that, that continues on to the momentum they have. Because even if facts get in the way of a momentum of a, a bandwagon, sometimes those facts aren't necessarily enough to stop the whole of the group and the group will just plow through without the facts supporting them. This is why we shouldn't necessarily join a bandwagon without good reason for doing so, because we'll miss when the bandwagon needs to make a turn and doesn't. What are some other examples of this? Uh, kind of a paraphrase from a website uh, example here, quote, Bill thinks that people should be able to install proprietary software as long as it's done the, in the privacy of their own computer, and they don't tell anyone. His friends laugh at him, accuse him of being uh, or leaning towards maximalism, and subtly threaten to ostracize him from the group. He decides to recant and abandon his decision to avoid rejection. This is him joining the bandwagon again after having some free thought and, and coming to a conclusion based on his own experience. The, the, the group doesn't gain from his experience. The group pressures him to capitulate, and then the information that he had is now lost. Even though this is something that you know he probably shouldn't be doing anyway, it's worth at least considering the possibility that he may be right. What's another example? There's an Adam Sandler video. I think I'm going to link on the bottom here somewhere, where uh, they talk about, or there's two uh, friends talking about joining a cult, and one of the quotes from that is, it's like, well, you know, if the leader says that the sun is evil, you know, just cheer along and say, oh yeah, fuck the sun. And, well, again, this is just an encouragement, an incitement to join the bandwagon. Cults are bandwagons. So if you join a cult, this is one of the things you're doing. And the, all the things that are wrong with bandwagons are equally wrong with cults. Uh, so, no, don't just 
agree with what they think about the sun without critically thinking about it. Just look at what they're saying and see if it's true, and then believe it. What are some ways around this? Uh, probably, I would say that the best way around this particular problem is to have an informed sense of history, to actually read what people were like before you were born in your particular area or, or topic of expertise or your your, your church, your, your tribe, your culture, your country, your everything that has to do with your identity as you see it, go and see what the history involved in it is. You know, if you're in the political context, be wary of the things that different political groups have tried in the past and the consequences of those attempts in the past. If you're not into politics, have a sense of what people in your industry have done in the past. The, the over, not, not just the, the kind of overall trends, but the, the, the actual impacts and the things that have happened when people jumped together in groups and formed bandwagons in the past, how did that go for them? See if you can find out and see if what you're doing is any different. And the more informed you are by history, I would suspect, the less you'll fall for this sort of thing. Beware, the second thing that you can do is something that you should be doing anyway, which is beware of groups and fads in general. Uh, if something is not really all that popular, and then becomes popular in a hurry, chances are it's gaining from this effect. And so you should be skeptical when you see stuff like that happen. If, for example, the Orange Crush, the NDP wave over Quebec, worked very much over this principle. Yes, there are good reasons why people should be you know, participating in that. But again, it's something that kind of came out of nowhere and is based purely on this kind of illogical premise of that people should join a successful project because it's successful and when its success depends on people joining it. So, uh, hipsterism uh, is currently kind of a pejorative in our, the, the current 2015 internet culture. Uh, and I, I would say it shouldn't be as much as it is. Uh, it has some value in diffusing bandwagons and bandwagon arguments. And it, although it, it's possible to com commercialize to kind of a second order hipster behavior in large groups, uh, it's still worth considering, uh, I guess, participating in it uh, to some extent because of the, the first order effects that you're possibly avoiding by, by not necessarily accepting every trend that comes along because your friends like it. Now, that, as mentioned, there, there is this kind of second level order or second order level effect that could be uh, kind of seen where especially people uh, in the hipster I don't even know what you call a group of hipsters, but the, w when hipsters get compromised and they end up buying things that they probably shouldn't to, to participate in things. Uh, but that, that I think is a topic for another video and it would be interesting to kind of discuss, but not totally relevant here. What are some valid examples of bandwagons being used in a proper way? Uh, social facts, facts that are true when people believe them. It's, it's just, we're, 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 we're selecting the, 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 the very few things in the universe that are defined when people believe them. Uh, and in those cases, then this isn't really a logical fallacy so much as, you know, you're observing what people believe and then admitting that those people believe that thing. Not a huge deal. Um, another possible and contentious counterexample, and I'm not going to say one way or the other, which I believe, uh, is that of language. Because if everyone believes that a, a word means something, uh, and everyone believes that grammar should work in a certain way, then it actually probably seems closer to a social fact in that there is, you know, where else would you get the meaning of a word if not for what people are actually using it for? Of course, different authorities are going to want different meanings for different words, and so you're going to have to, for some extent, choose which authorities you trust and follow. Again, this is a contentious issue, but definitely related uh, in that no matter how you solve it, pretty much you're going to be jumping on one or another bandwagon. And kind of as a last note, uh, although we haven't talked about supply and demand curves, it's worth pointing out that this effect screws with them. And so you maybe want to be careful if you're modeling supply and demand uh, to kind of leave a variable out for this particular impact or uh, fallacy to impact your model in case it does. So, in conclusion, don't just follow the latest fad. Don't just believe things because your friends believe them. Don't just listen to me because I'm some guy on the internet. 
go and see and verify everything that you want to believe uh, to the extent that it's important to your life. If you have any questions or would like uh, me to form a group for you uh, to so that you can believe something, um, feel free to ask and anywhere where this uh, video is posted. Uh, as usual, there should be a little Bitcoin address to donate so that you can support our, uh, our, our, our whiteboard marker fund, which is probably going to need another one in the not too distant future. Uh, and uh, hopefully you enjoy. See you next video.